good evening good afternoon uh, depending on which part of the world you are joining us today from um, i'm sarthak bakchi i teach here at the school of arts and sciences uh, at ahmedabad university and i'm delighted and extremely pleased to welcome you uh, for another edition of the uh, seminar and lecture series uh, which we are which we are doing in the webinar format now and on the on an online platform uh, due to the pandemic and due to these uneasy times that we are facing and uh, today it gives me great pleasure to uh, invite two very distinguished scholars uh, who will talk to us and uh, discuss with us uh, about uh, doing research and about dif uh, finding different methods uh, and doing the difficulty of doing research in these uneasy times and uh, this today's webinar and today's topic has been uh, uh, convened by and has been thought of by uh, my colleague professor maya and whom i will invite in uh, just uh, a moment of time uh, to explain about today's uh, webinar in more detail uh, but before that uh, before we begin uh, the formal session uh, i would just like to explain to you a little bit about uh, what we are uh, doing here at uh, ahmedabad university and at the school of arts and sciences so this is a very uh, fairly new university uh, ahmedabad university about uh, a decade old uh, and the School of Arts and Science is a very dynamic, young uh, place of, uh, um, you know, finding uh, very new kinds of uh, new modes of engaging uh, with the questions, with the contemporary questions uh, which are existing in today's society. Uh, and we try to look at it uh, from an interdisciplinary lens and we try to uh, find out, uh, you know, answers to the puzzles uh, that are uh, existing in today's times. Uh, and we, we do that with a very distinguished set of uh, faculty members uh, and also a very curious and enthusiastic bunch of students uh, whom we have been uh, very fortunate to have with us uh, over this very exciting uh, few years that, uh, that the School of Arts and Sciences has been uh, in place. And uh, the seminar and lecture series in, uh, is actually one of those kind of platforms which uh, makes way or makes the scope for uh, this kind of a meaningful engagement between uh, distinguished scholars and uh, established scholars uh, all across the world and across disciplines uh, and our own faculty members and our own students. Uh, and uh, this seminar lecture series, uh, due to the pandemic, we have been fortunate uh, in, in a sense, uh, in a very, in a very you know, twist of fate, we have been fortunate enough to uh, switch to an online platform, which enables us to to get uh, people who would accommodate us, uh, you know, in, in the early morning hours, uh, and still uh, would help uh, us in understanding these questions and these, uh, you know, problems better. Uh, and that is what we are thankful to, um, you know, today's speakers also. And uh, before, uh, you know, um, uh, before uh, progressing with the with the with the session, uh, let me just introduce to you uh, who our uh, special uh, speakers for today are. Uh, so we are delighted to welcome uh, Professor Anand Pandian and Professor Savisachi uh, for today's uh, session with us. Uh, professor Anand is a professor, Anand Pandian is a professor and department chair at the Department of Anthropology uh, at Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA. Uh, his work concerns the ecological horizons of human aspiration and experience, a theme that has animated uh, his work from the earliest uh, to his most recent work. Uh, which is the a possible anthropology methods for uneasy times. Uh, Anand's other notable works include uh, the real world and anthropology of creation, which grapples, as he puts it, with the turbulent ecology of the creative process. Uh, Ayaz accounts a ledger of hope in modern India, uh, which takes his grandfather's life in Burma and India as an aperture for uh, a century of tremendous aspiration and upheaval. Uh, Anand's intellectual collaborations are manifold and span a number of edited volumes, such as uh, Ethical Life in South Asia uh, with Daud Ali, uh, Race, Nature, and the Politics of Difference uh, with K. Uh, Kozik and Donald Moore, uh, and Crumpel Paper Boat, a book of ventures in experimental ethnographic writing with Stuart McLean. Uh, Anand also works with film, fiction, and publicly engaged writing. Uh, among the many awards and honors, that recognize his contributions to anthropology, the most recent has been the prestigious Infosys Prize uh, in social sciences. Uh, and so we are, we are really thankful that Anand has today taken time uh, from his schedule and uh, taken time to uh, join us in, uh, as part of this webinar. Uh, and we are also delighted to welcome 
uh, Professor Savya Sachi, uh, uh, who is a professor at the Department of Sociology at Jamia Millia Islamia, where he has taught for many years. His engagement with anthropology as a practice of fieldwork, writing, thinking, and teaching has been theoretically grounded, wide ranging, and very creative. Uh, he's the author of Tribal Forest Dwellers and Self Rule, the Constituent Assembly Debates on the Fifth and the Sixth uh, Schedules. Uh, a landmark conceptual and archival work on the salience of the constituent assembly debates in constituting tribal and Adivasi identity in post-independence India. Uh, his edited works include Between Sky and Earth, uh, the Penguin Book of Forest Writings, uh, Intractable Conflicts in Contemporary India, uh, Narratives and Social Movements, and uh, Social Movements, the Transformative Shapes and Turning Points uh, with Ravi Kumar. Um, he also has numerous critical essays in academic and public forums on themes as diverse as ecological and cultural rights, architecture, religion, Gandhian philosophy and pedagogy, human rights, anthropological theory, and the political economy of conservation, biodiversity mapping, and natural resources governance regimes in India and the world. His teaching transcends the classroom and embraces many modalities and formats of engaged learning. He's currently visiting faculty in the social sciences for architecture students uh, in a program titled Building Beauty, based on the work of the architecture Christopher Alexander, which explores dualism and non-dualism in architecture and in life. So we're extremely delighted to have such uh, distinguished speakers for today's session. And uh, without further ado, I now pass on the, uh, the mantle to uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Maya Ratnam, uh, who will take forward uh, the session from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarthak, uh, for those introductions. Um, thank you, Anand, uh, for agreeing to rise and shine at this unearthly hour and join us uh, in our conversation. Uh, thanks a lot. Professor Savasat Sachi, uh, thank you also uh, for uh, enduring the untimely demands of your students with uh, such good humor. Uh, I can see many friends and anthropologists uh, from various time zones and parts of the world who've joined us. Uh, thanks uh, so much uh, for, showing, uh, for showing this enthusiasm. Uh, it is my uh, really uh, extraordinary pleasure and privilege to be convener of uh, today's event. Um, Professor Pandian and Professor Savyasachi are uh, one way to describe them as, as scholars and anthropologists of uh, South Asia. Uh, both their early works uh, dealt with uh, uh, communities uh, uh, whose cultures were very intimately shaped by their proximity to nature, but in distinctively South Asian, uh, South Asian context. Uh, while Anand's work, uh, Crooked Stocks, talked about an agrarian milieu uh, in South, South India, uh, Professor Savyasachi's work takes a deep dive into the forests of uh, Abhujmar in, uh, in Chhattisgarh. Uh, now, uh, Forest and field are very important themes uh, in my own work. Uh, and Professor Sachi uh, and Anand have been uh, longtime teachers and mentors of mine. Uh, so it may seem a tad self-indulgent of me to have convened this conversation. Uh, but for the fact, uh, you know, that uh, I've, I've uh, but for the fact that uh, the corpus of both of their writing uh, and thinking uh, spans, uh, you know, disciplinary concerns that go much further than, uh, than, the, than the ethnographic particularities that they started out engaging uh, and speaks to wider questions of philosophical and uh, humanistic uh, import. Uh, and one of the reasons that I've always wondered what uh, this conversation would uh, look like is because there are some common themes uh, in, their, uh, in their thinking, uh, uh, albeit expressed and communicated uh, very differently. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to see how uh, this conversation would go. Uh, and one of these, of course, as Sarthak's already mentioned and as Anand has written, uh, is uh, really thinking about a certain um, ecological horizon or frame for human life and, and human aspiration. Uh, that is the environment, not just as an object of, uh, of study or an object of contemplation, uh, but something that um, uh, is a dimension really of the ecological as a dimension of thinking and being uh, uh, in, the, in the world and in understanding how human beings relate to themselves, to others and to the non-human world. Um, the other salient theme in um, sort of both their writings over the years um, has been this sort of deep and sustained reflection on the promise of anthropological methods for approaching some very intractable questions uh, political, philosophical, and the everyday, and in their commitment to uh, developing an anthropological vocabulary, really as a way of um, as a way of bridging between the very 
concrete and sometimes idiosyncratic circumstances of people's lives and the more kind of abstract and macro processes that people uh, find themselves, uh, you know, imbricated in. Uh, as uh, Sarthak has said, uh, you know, I think uh, we can all agree that on a, you know, on a sort of existential level, we're in a time of uh, great disorientation and great uh, unease, uh, as it were. And at least in our popular discourse, um, um, I was just watching American news yesterday. Uh, this word uh, uh, crisis seems to haunt uh, our understanding of the state of uh, of the state of this world. Uh, you know, our ordinary lives have shaped ourselves, shaped themselves uh, unimaginably around a pandemic. Uh, the climate crisis is ongoing. Uh, there's, uh, you know, an erosion of trust in very basic democratic processes. Um, and, um, you know, the academic world uh, seems uh, besieged by various forms of critique, uh, you know, you know, across the world. Uh, and at least, um, you know, academic freedoms are under under threat uh, in various, you know, in various sorts of sorts of ways. Um, one of the things that has, I think, uh, uh, I'll try not to go on too long, but I just wanted to frame uh, the discussion a little bit. So uh, I hope that's okay. So one of the things that's really been the sort of stock in trade of anthropology has been, I think, to recover the ordinary from extreme circumstances of vulnerability or poverty or, or violence. How do people go on and how do they find resources for economic, social and cultural life, even in the midst of tremendous structural uh, hardships? Uh, our, the sites in which we practice um, anthropology, the discipline of anthropology, have now uh, proliferated far beyond their traditional sort of setups. Um, you know, we now work in sites of great precarity and danger and volatility in zones of contamination, in war zones, um, uh, you know, borders and check posts, refugee camps, um, the virtual sphere, uh, air, water, space, uh, scientific worlds, financial flows. Um, but some of the older criticisms of anthropology as a discipline have persisted. Uh, its alignments with imperial rule, with racist and Eurocentric uh, knowledge production, uh, and increasingly with the uh, inequities of, um, of neoliberalism. So in this context, um, how can revisiting these older disciplinary questions help us? And what sort of future for research and fieldwork and thinking activity itself can we imagine? Um, I believe that there can be like a fairly staid way of approaching these questions and uh, more sort of imaginative possibilities that our uh, disciplines afford. Uh, and I think that both our speakers today, uh, you know, uh, come firmly on the side of a, of a very imaginative way of con contemplating and writing about anthropology's response, uh, uh, you know, response to the, to the world. Um, and um, in his latest book, A Possible Anthropology, Methods for Uneasy Times, uh, Anand takes up some of these challenges uh, explicitly. So this is not intended as a book discussion or a symposium, but I thought Anand, uh, some of the questions and provocations that you raise, uh, we can use them as springboards for, uh, you know, just sort of a further discussion. Um, and even though the sort of immediate provocations for this book are located in the anxieties of, uh, you know, professional American anthropology and academia, which uh, clearly at a certain moment was attended uh, uh, you know, by a state of shock at political development, such as the coming to power of, uh, you know, of Trump, but also sort of more a more pervasive sense of uh, malaise and disenchantment uh, that one feels, uh, you know, amongst uh, younger scholars, uh, you know, accusations of entrenched hierarchies based on race and, uh, and gender, um, you know, the proliferation of kind of um, short term positions and more precarious academic uh, positions. Uh, so the book may start off with some of these questions as provocations, but it's subsequent reflections and engagements, uh, I do believe are of uh, wider relevance to all of us who are academic practitioners and uh, teachers and uh, just citizens really in, uh, you know, of different of different parts of the world. Um, so very briefly, uh, I lay out uh, a few themes that the book talks about. Um, and um, and we can uh, and we can kind of go on from there. So um, one of the first things Anand uh, that you discuss in the book is this uh, is this idea of uh, of empiricism uh, and a, a exploration of empiricism. And um, if a sort of definitive, if there's one kind of definitive stamp to uh, anthropology, it's that uh, you know we go there, we stay there over extended periods of time and carry knowledge, carry knowledge back. And this very complex process is glossed as uh, as fieldwork. 
Uh, and is this, uh, you know, the, what we understand as empiricism or the ground of grounds for empiricism in, in anthropology? Uh, in your book, you suggest that empiricism is something more than just a description of reality or facts and their interpretation, that there is a mysterious quality, an alchemy almost, to the empiricism that anthropology claims for its own, whether it's in the magical or occult dimensions of life that people call forth or the more mundane details of their existence. Uh, so could you elaborate on this a little bit, please? Um, you trek through the thinking, working, and writing practices of many fascinating figures. Some are the sort of founding parents of anthropology, like Malinowski and Levi Strauss. Others are more contemporary and established anthropologists. Uh, and still others, you put it, more renegade figures like the African-American writer and folklorist, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, more renegade figures. Um, uh, what uh, what made you juxtapose these figures and put them into conversation with each other? That uh, I think many of us who've read the book were curious about that. Uh, the third theme, um, a third salient theme uh, in your book is, um, is about, is it deals with experience um, and anthropology and as a method and as a discipline is concerned at its broadest level with the terrain of human experience, I think, and the diversity of human experience. Um, but it's not, uh, you know, not just difference for the sake of it, but that there is an underlying coherence to that, you know, these diverse experiences and we need to be, we need to get at this in order to deepen our understanding about, uh, you know, about the human species. Um, but as you also note in your book, um, experience as the grounds uh, for knowledge has been, has been challenged from various quarters. Uh, anthropology itself has been challenged for its fetishization of experience. Um, uh, just a very banal example, uh, maybe familiar to some of us who teach the neighborhoods module and foundation, very often our students will just come back to us when they're assigned to their neighborhoods and say, but they just refuse to talk to us. Uh, so, you know, these uh, forms, many forms of uh, kind of uh, ethnographic refusal uh, abound. And just to pull at a few random threads, uh, the sense that, you know, uh, my experience uh, cannot be the vehicle of another self-knowledge that my experience is not knowable to another, uh, and that um, any experience that is not grounded uh, in, a, uh, in a sort of participation in shared politics of inequality or a shared politics of identity cannot really be the vehicle for an authentic, uh, authentic knowledge. Um, these are, of course, recurring critiques, but is there still something to uh, recuperate or redeem in this domain of experience? or? Uh, to uh, misquote Walter Benjamin, uh, is the terrain of historical experience uh, just as the ground of anthropological knowledge just exhausted now? Um, uh, the a fourth uh, theme that you explore, Anand, uh, is uh, that anthropology as the kind of conventional domain of the of the human. Uh, but again, we are faced uh, with the realization that this category of the human is not just flat or self-evident. Otherwise, there would not be so many historical instances of explicitly denying humanity to certain others with whom we share the species boundary. Um, and um, I mean, some of the more esoteric examples in anthropology, perhaps uh, to a non-anthropological audience, come from places like Amerindian, uh, Amerindian cosmology, where humanness or humanity is not just restricted to the human species, but is really distributed in a, in a field. Uh, and here I just want to very quickly uh, bring in a, a beautiful article of uh, Savya Sachi's called The uh, Tiger and the Honeybee, which has worked its way into uh, many ecology and society syllabi uh, in, uh, in India, uh, which, is, uh, which talks about how um, there is a form of co-living between Adivasi forest dwellers, between honeybees and tigers and other species in the forest. Uh, but then the conservation regime kind of comes in and vests the tiger with a, a unique and privileged humanity and how that sort of disrupts and uh, dislocates uh, uh, the, the understandings of relation, you know, relationships in the forest, forest universe. Um, um, and lastly, um, the book talks about uh, anthropology as a form of social critique, uh, engaging with the poetry and ethnography of, uh, I think it was uh, Nomi Watts, if I'm right, uh, who works in um, many sites of US military simulations where uh, many disturbing things uh, happen. And this just left me thinking about um, just the question of um, how we as anthropologists uh, respond to certain very uh, disturbing and disorienting situations, not just field situations as it were, but just situations that we, we encounter. I think many of us were witness to, um, uh, you know, the, 
the exodus of uh, migrant workers that happened with the with the lockdown and you know while some people immediately jumped into the fray they helped they you know they were involved in emergency food distribution uh, there were very good journalists who tracked uh, the journeys and the sufferings of these workers people were filing pil in the courts um, still others some of us were just haunted by a kind of uh, paralysis um, in a kind of kind of knowing what to do in in such a in in such a circumstance um, and in those moments, really, the capacities for uh, for sympathy, for transcending, uh, you know, our locations, our immediacy, our experiences, uh, it, it sort of seems limited. And then one just has a choice to respond. Then, as a as a human being who wants to, uh, in whatever capacity, help a fellow human being. Um, so those are sort of the themes that Anand you bring out uh, uh, in your book, and I was uh, thinking now maybe you could talk a little more about that, uh, and then uh, Professor Savisachi, if you'd like to uh, respond to that, and then we can just see how it goes. Really kind introduction and uh, a set of provocations regarding this recent book of mine. It's really an honor to be speaking with you all. Thank you as well to Satak for the kind introduction. And it's, uh, it's, it's actually quite, it's been quite extraordinary to see the development of new university spaces in India in the recent years, like Ahmedabad University and to get in some fashion to be able to participate in the conversation, regardless of what distance that might be unfolding uh, through is, uh, is really a, a, an honor. So I, I do appreciate this. The book itself that Maya has been speaking of, the copy here, uh, it's, it was published in late 2019 by Duke University Press here in the United States. And we're actually still working on getting an Indian edition and just don't have um, the plans for that finalized as of yet. So hopefully I'll have news about that at some point soon. But as Maya has suggested, the book is one in which I try to wrestle with some of the conundrums in which contemporary anthropology, but more specifically contemporary American anthropology, it's true, are caught as a way of trying to think through what it means to pursue methods of social science research in the face of grave existential political and social uh, unease and uncertainty. It's a book that I wrote during the Trump years here in the United States and the shadow of these new forms of political upheaval here were loomed very large on the manuscript as it came together, but it is one that I'd been thinking about for some time as a practicing anthropologist, having to make sense to people of what exactly it is that one does and with what intent as an anthropologist. It's, it's not something that is very straightforward and can be explained in any, any coherent way, but it's, it's something that I think we need answers for, most especially given the kinds of circumstances that Maya has been speaking of, circumstances that for so many people have been difficult for quite a long time due to the pervasive forms of inequality and exploitation that organize so many modern societies around the world, be it in India, the United States, and elsewhere, but forms of exploitation and inequality that have only magnified in their force and consequence over these last few months or even these last few years with the rise of authoritarian populist politics with the magnification of uh, border crises and uh, uh, the existential um, uh, impossibility of living as migrants and refugees with the magnification of the climate crisis and other forms of uh, environmental devastation whose uh, consequences cascade uh, ever more forcefully into the present. And it is absolutely the case, as Maya suggests, that anthropologists do seek to wrestle with these kinds of difficulties, all of which, of course, come into the, uh, the mix when it comes to the pandemic that has now caught hold of so many of us now in very, very different ways. Uh, 
and it, and it matters absolutely whether one gets to kind of sit in one's attic as I'm doing now in the United States sort of teaching and lecturing from home uh, or whether one is caught uh, homeless and, uh, and, and, and forced to kind of find a way to navigate a, a, an impossible lockdown as was the case for millions of people in India and elsewhere um, when the pandemic hit in the spring of this year. So these are all very, very difficult circumstances, but they are circumstances that we have tried to make sense of as social science researchers, as anthropologists. And in fact, the argument that I see to in this book is that there's something about the way in which we work with the world or think with the world and its complexities that lends a field like anthropology certain tools and resources with which to make sense of circumstances as fraught as these. That is to say, even when life in the world lands us in the midst of unexpected circumstances, fields like anthropology, I think, have were, have developed over a long time tools with which to wrestle with precisely those unexpected conjunctures. To give just a brief account of the book before I read just a little bit of it, um, as Maya mentioned, there are a few elements in the narrative and and they, I think they, they bring home what I'm saying now. I have a chapter in which I think through the question of empiricism in anthropology and the argument that I make is that it is precisely because the venture in anthropology is to think with the empirical complexity of the world at hand and to do something with that ineff ineffability of empirical reality that in some ways I think we're especially equipped to anticipate and make some provisional sense of circumstances as complex and fraught as the ones that I've been speaking of. A second chapter suggests that this uh, sense-making work, this thinking with the complexity of the world at hand operates or unfolds through what I describe as a method of experience. That is to say, a series of ways in which through our field work, through our teaching, through our reading and our writing, we confront and not only in a sense sort of seek to master and contain uh, the multiplicity of things that we encounter as anthropologists, but to actually give that multiplicity some space uh, to actually unfold and even uh, express its force through the texture of what it is that we write and think, that we channel that uh, openness of uh, the that experience, that experiential immersion through the work that we produce and that the work therefore gives, again, a way of attesting to that, those forms of existential uncertainty rather than simply trying to kind of master or domesticate them from the outside. And third, I make the case that all of this allows us to give alternative and critical accounts of humanity and what is at stake in our humanity as anthropologists, once again, that what we attend to as anthropologists is not necessarily human beings as they are, or humanity as it is, but to seek to somehow open the horizons of what I call a humanity to come. That is to say, thinking through the ways in which anthropology invites encounters and immersion with forms of experience that are foreign to one's own as a way of kindling the ability to actually conjure up fellow feeling with circumstances and beings whose conditions are very much unlike our own, that we, we seek to cultivate that kind of fellow feeling and that once again we have resources with which to do that and I try to show that in the book by looking at the public life of anthropology in uh, fields like contemporary politics, indigenous politics, of the kind perhaps that's related to what Professor Sachi may uh, be uh, working on now or has, has written about uh, in the, the field of uh, contemporary fiction and even in contemporary art. And I try to trace some of those uh, lineages and all of this I seek to argue uh, attest to the ways in which what anthropology affords us are 
resources to practice what I describe as a kind of affirmative critique, pursuing critique, not simply as a kind of negation or denunciation of what is, but instead thinking of critique as a means of opening alternative forms of possibility in what in a in a circumstance that would otherwise appear to be closed and fixed. So that in a nutshell is the kind of uh, into the, the, the argumentative trajectory of the book as a whole. But to give that a little more flesh, if I may, I'll just read just one uh, small excerpt from the second chapter on experience. And if I can just share some images while I do that. So this is just a small excerpt from the second chapter of the book, uh, which I would call in this context, uh, wrestling with the unexpected in anthropology. And this should at least give you a flavor of how it's written and uh, the, the kinds of figures and concerns that I wrestle with in the narrative. In 1982, the anthropologist E. Valentine Daniel applied for a research grant from the Social Science Research Council hoping to study the folk songs of Tamil women laborers on the tea estates of his native Sri Lanka. By the time he arrived the next year, anti-Tamil riots had convulsed the country, his would-be singers desperately salvaging what they could from burnt out homes. Before I knew it, defying all research designs and disciplinary preparations, Daniel later wrote in Charred Lullabies, I was entangled in a project that had me rather than I, it. Straightforward words of research method, like evidence and informant, took on terrifying meanings among unrelenting tales of violence. The anthropologist found he had no choice but to forego his plans and to follow instead the trail of these rumors. Fieldwork became an effort to grasp the significance of an unexpected and fearsome circumstance. A few years later, Gloria Goodwin Raheja, who had studied anthropology alongside Daniel at the University of Chicago in the 1970s, returned to a village in North India that she knew well to continue her own studies of caste and rural society. It so happened that she had taken her children with her, Raheja recalls in Listen to the Heron's Words. Her daughter staunchly refused to drink the water buffalo milk on hand. And so Raheja was forced to spend hours each day nursing the young child in the household courtyard. I found myself sitting in the courtyard with her in my lap for a good part of the day, and so I turned my attention to the tapes, she writes, describing how she finally came to listen closely to the recordings of women's songs she had once made in the village. The words of the songs allowed me to hear, at last, that women were not the unquestioned bearers of tradition I had assumed them to be. Were it not for this accident of experience in the field, her book with Anne Grodzin's gold on women's expressive traditions in India would never have come into being. We know it well, the character of the anthropological picaresque, as Lawrence Cohen calls it in No Aging in India. Something was wrong. I grew ever more desperate. So many of us, like Cohen, could say about our misadventures in fieldwork. It was only when I abandoned looking for what I understood, for what I thought I knew, that I began to find it. I first read Daniel and Raheja in a seminar taught by Cohen at the University of California, Berkeley in the late 1990s. And soon enough, I too would encounter the discipline's strange ways of eventually somehow working out, when my own plans for dissertation fieldwork in South India went sour. How could I know whether it was in fact worthwhile? what I wound up pursuing instead in the name of research. The mind is a monkey, a philosophical parable I often encountered in those years in India would warn. And yet I learned, like so many of my teachers and peers, that there was a way to reconcile oneself with the tugs of its curiosity, to let it wander on a wider leash, to sustain the faith that something worth knowing would eventually be seen. This is an image, by the way, from the Tamil film uh, uh, Kartama by the director Bharati Raja. It is almost a truism and cliche to say that anthropology lands us in the midst of things unexpected. To dismiss this as a commonplace, however, is to leave opaque something essential in the generation and transmission of knowledge in the discipline. 
For what is at stake here is the relationship between truth and accident, the way that experience in anthropology invites us to stumble over insights of enduring value, as if the arbitrary and the abiding were somehow fused inextricably together in what we do. There is the deep uncertainty of the field environments in which we work, a discordance that demands, as Daniel writes, a set of disparate and desperate forays into the roughest of waters in order to recover meaning. There is also the challenge of bearing witness to this discordance in whatever we write and say thereafter, of carrying through this experience and its trouble. As charred lullabies reminds us, the poesis of culture itself is a narcotic, and narcotics cannot still the tooth that nibbles at the soul. Such are the difficulties faced by an intellectual enterprise that flits ever so restlessly between reportage and poetry, science and art. What does it mean for anthropology to be the most scientific of the humanities, the most humanist of the sciences, as Eric Wolf once put it? Think of all those methodological quirks that lend anthropology its peculiarity as a scholarly endeavor. Pursuit of knowledge in unknown and often tumultuous circumstances. Immersion in marginal and bygone ways of being in the world. The writerly traffic in metaphors, myths, and other deliberately affecting modes of narration. The inescapable presence of the scholar herself as witness and interpreter. It is undeniable indeed, to borrow from Clifford Geertz, the oddity of constructing texts ostensibly scientific out of experiences broadly biographical. And yet it seems that we have no more and no less than precisely this, a method of experience. This is an image of Zora Neale Hurston, the American folklorist, anthropologist, and novelist conducting her fieldwork in the American South in the 1920s. In anthropology, Victor Turner writes, experience is a journey, a test, a ritual passage, an exposure to peril, and an exposure to fear, a form of practical yet poetical knowledge. Turner's words help to underscore that experience involves more than what happens in a given situation. There's also the question of how one is disposed to such happenings, whether they are taken as circumstances to be engaged or just endured. We know that fieldwork demands a spirit of openness to the unexpected, an attunement to, to its elusive promise as a basis for knowledge. Would it be so surprising if such an orientation, honed through intense trials, undergone in some unfamiliar place, carried over into other milieus in which anthropologists also think and work? What dispositions toward the world does an anthropologist cultivate and carry between office and field site, library and classroom? Is there a consistency to what unfolds in the name of anthropology across these dif different domains? It has long been a dictum of anthropology that its methods cannot be taught and only undergone. The style set early in the century of giving a student a good theoretical orientation and then sending him off to live among a primitive people with the expectation that he would work everything out for himself survives to this day, Margaret Mead observes in her 1972 memoir, Blackberry Winter. Men who are now professors teach their students as their professors taught them. And if young field workers do not give up in despair, go mad, ruin their health, or die, they do, after a fashion, become anthropologists. These risks are serious, the physical and existential trials endured by these scholars in circumstances beyond their control. In a field whose research often takes women scholars in and out of disparate domains of male authority, instances of sexual harassment and gender violence are far from uncommon. And episodes of misery, loneliness, tedium, and radical doubt are almost inevitable. Preparation for such challenges can be a maddening conceit. One may be taught the value of in-depth conversations, copious notes, and sustained exposure to a novel place. But as Renato Rosaldo learned in the highlands of the Philippines in 1981, work in anthropology can suddenly throw us into moments of unthinkable force. I stare at the fly. One back leg rubs the other. Sky and earth heave 
pressed together. Pressure on my lungs, tidal welling, overwhelms my exhalation. Rosaldo and his partner, Michelle Zimbalist Rosaldo, had just arrived in Ifugao for two months of field work when she slipped from a narrow cliffside trail and fell to her death in the river below. Renato, looking after their two young children in the village at the time, was crushed by the sight when her body was found. I began to fathom the force of what Ilongots had been telling me about their losses through the accident of my own devastating loss and not through any systematic preparation for field research, he later wrote. Decades later, he would recount the event in an extraordinary book of poetry, The Day of Shelley's Death. Poems such as The Fly do not try to draw lessons from this death in any straightforward way, as if to turn this moment of incomparable grief into a resource for generalization. And yet, there is a different kind of teaching that these words countenance, a task more ethical than technical asking the readers to imagine being given over completely to the sheer evanescence of life. The work of poetry, as I practice it in this collection, is to bring its subject, whether pain, sorrow, shock, or joy, home to the reader, Rosaldo writes. It is a place to dwell and savor more than a place for quick assessment. Acknowledging the text itself as such a difficult place to dwell stretches our sense of what is a field and where it may be found in anthropology. Fieldwork, Akhil Gupta and James Ferguson writes, may be understood as a form of motivated and stylized dislocation. Given what we've seen here in the company of anthropologists at work, we may also ask what conditions and circumstances allow for such displacement. For when we look across the range of those practices most essential to the discipline, what we find is that they have a surprising amount in common with each other. Reading or teaching, encountering others or writing about those encounters, ensconced in a study or out and about in a wider world. Could the difference between these activities and their places be a matter of degree rather than a matter of kind? At stake here is the very sense of the field in anthropology. Our fields of experience have no more definite boundaries than have our fields of view, William James suggests. Both are fringed forever by a more that continuously develops and that continuously supersedes them as life proceeds. The field of anthropology may be found wherever we are in the company of someone or something that focuses and kindles this more that pushes us beyond ourselves in novel and unexpected ways. Being there somewhere else does indeed matter, whether caught in the twists of an unfinished sentence or captivated by the charge of a classroom tale. I should say, by the way, that this image that you're looking at is an image of Levi Strauss's study in Paris, which I had a chance to visit as part of the research for this book. We ought not to think of this, however, as something to sally for, only then to return home, of stumbling, that is, upon profoundly unsettling things before submitting those encounters to a necessary domestication. The idea of the field as a break or hiatus obscures what is most crucial about the experience, its transformative power, which must be carried over somehow across the divide between places familiar and strange. An experience has a unity that gives, its name, that gives it its name, John Dewey writes. The existence of this unity is constituted by a single quality that pervades the entire experience in spite of the variation of its constituent parts. Qualitative unity is what we find among the reading, writing, teaching, and research of anthropology, a force of encounter that passes onward across these distinctive domains, that carries the metamorphic charge of the unknown through diverse mediums of expression. Such is the method of experience unique to anthropology, working through experience of a field and working on the experience of those we share it with, a collective passage into altered states of being and understanding that can be focused and honed in consonant ways by all of the various techniques at our disposal. To be sure, knowledge always relies on experience in one way or another. 
What distinguishes anthropology is this unity of process and endpoint, method and object, means and ends. This is the source of the discipline's singular frustration and exhilaration, the sense of being caught up in a movement that doesn't let up. I think I'll actually stop at this point and, uh, and, and simply say that the effort in this book has been to try to make sense of how it is that anthropologists wrestle with circumstances beyond their control. And I've done this in relation to a variety of empirical situations in which anthropologists think and work. But my feeling is that the these methods and the lessons of trials such as these may also provide ways of wrestling with the complexity of what we encounter and struggle with even now in times of unprecedented uh, tumult and difficulty. And I look forward to talking about precisely those resonances and relationships in the discussion um, further. So I'll just stop with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anand. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, Professor Savisachi, would you, uh, yeah. uh, would you like you, to Anand. respond or, or say what you feel? Or... Yeah, thank you, Anand, for this wonderful presentation of your book. I read your book thoroughly and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it because uh, I felt that you were drawing upon the disciplinary history to address the questions of unease between, between students, among students, between students and faculty about institutions with their political regimes and a whole lot of other circumstances uh, uh, which are which you've described to us very briefly what i want to do is i want to show you an image and maybe draw you out more on certain specific uh, craftsmanships of the discipline uh, which we may have to transmit to students as they come to us to ask for guidance in terms of uh, how to conduct this research in very, very uh, discomforting circumstances as you just described. Uh, the trials and tabulations are certainly a very important aspect of this fieldwork. Uh, but uh, equally, uh, there, is, there needs to be some discussion on how do we prepare students to uh, do research in uh, these very, very difficult circumstances. And what I would want to do is to try and give you the world as I see it, uh, the larger world as we as it exists, and then maybe I'll draw upon my experiences uh, in India, uh, the research that I have done, and uh, you can draw upon yours in America because I have I don't have any idea of that world, uh, and you surely have some idea of India because uh, you have done some field work in India, so maybe there'll be some comparative exchange and that might be useful to uh, both of us and to our viewers here. So I think here is the image that I want to show. Uh, just a minute. I don't know how to do this. So how do you put it on the screen? So you will have to on, on your. So you need to share screen. Yeah. Uh, you see the green share screen at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, but it's not. I've opened the image on my screen, and yeah, there you are. Okay, can you see this picture? No, sir, you'll have to share it. So on your, will... Zoom, on your Zoom screen, you will find the share screen option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in that, uh, you can share the screen. Uh, so then okay. we will be able to see the picture from your computer screen. It does not allow Zoom to share your screen. So somebody has to allow me to do that. You should already be allowed to do that. I think you are, you are because yeah, you are the co-host. You'll be able to see that. Anyway. You want to quickly, uh, can you quickly? You could also do that, sir. If you want to just email it to me, then I can share it. While you speak, uh, we'll and I can, I will put that. And okay. I can put it up I'll, as I'll you're do. talking. If you want to. Okay. Do. I'll try and do that in a minute, but let me pose a question to Anand and then when I have time, I'll just send it. All right. You. Okay. Uh, okay, Anand, I, I would like to just share with you my idea of the history of the discipline as I have learned it. Mm. Uh, uh, not only in the university, but in my uh, study of the history of the discipline as I went and did fieldwork and as questions came to me uh, in the course of doing fieldwork. 
uh, I see classical social anthropological tradition as having two different platforms. One is a set of anthropologists who actually supported the dominant regime in the state and legitimized whatever they had to do with the people. Uh, very unkind things and very horrible things. And equally, there was another tradition, which was, say, in the works of Radcliffe Brown, Malinowski, Ivan Pritchard, who actually went out, who actually uh, part of an anarchist tradition uh, within Europe, uh, if we take the words of uh, David Graeber to uh, have some value there. And what they brought to their anthropology was this anarchist tradition, an anarchist mm -hmm. thought, which actually wanted to search for different ways of organizing social life than the one that was given to us by the Industrial Revolution and Enlightenment. And especially I see that their works were a critique of the Kontian idea, that societies have to move from magic religion then to science. Uh, when Malinowski writes his work on magic, science, and religion, uh, he's trying to uh, take uh, issues with that kind of a understanding of, of, so, of the social. And when we read uh, Savage, uh, Sex and Repression in Savage Society, we see that Malinowski is engaging with Freud. Uh, when we read uh, SFLS and Segmentary Systems of Evans Pritchard, we see that he's trying to take issues with state as being the only mode of organizing social life uh, in the world. <laughs> and you know, equally, when you read Levi Strauss's work on savage mind, towards the end, he takes issue with Sartre on uh, what is the whole constitution of reason uh, that uh, is being discussed. And I come to the conclusion that anthropology is actually one expression of the use of reason to understand the world in which we live. But what this tradition of anthropology actually does it is tries to uh, not not follow the instrumentalist reason, which is critiqued by Horkenheimer in Dialectics of Enlightenment, where he says the task of reason is actually to disenchant the world. So these anthropologists go to far flung places, and this is all pre colonial. This is not the post colonial era, in the pre colonial era. And what they do is they try and look at myths which have been rejected in the Kontian paradigm, uh, legends which have no value at all. They look at superstitions. And what they try to do is they re-enchant the world. Mm. They try and construct a different kind of reason, a different kind of mode of thinking, which looks at the enchanted world as a possible way of understanding social life, not only in that world, but also in the European world, which has actually rejected it. So in the course of time, we see a lot of anthropological work being used to understand modern societies. Now, the point that I'm trying to draw you on is that while anthropology grew, to enrich reason as a mode of thinking. That reason is in crisis at the moment. The possibility of a critique is jeopardized because reason itself is in a deep crisis. Any reasonable thought which you put in the public domain is not sustained. Dissent has got a very bad name. Critical thinking is not understood as a mode of working with differences. Uh, critical thinking is shunned, uh, so much so that all regimes across the world, I mean, I, I can say this with confidence, that all political regimes are not very happy with social sciences performing the duty just to say what they see. This is one side of the story. The second side of the story is the people whom we research with are no longer passive sort of objects of research that anthropologists would, would undertake to go and talk to. Uh, in pre-colonial times. You know, Linda Tohibi Smith, when she writes about decolonizing anthropology and decolonizing methodologies, the sequel to that is that if you have to do, a, do research in Maori, amongst the Maori people, you need to show them the text. You need to get their approval, right? And before you can present it. So I am, I am, I am, I am debating with this predicament that how does anthropology, how, does the, how can we learn from the disciplinary history of anthropology to reinstitute reason in the public domain and legitimize critique as a valid way of understanding differences. And that is a very big crisis across the world. In our own little departments, it may not be such a big crisis. I, I mean, it is a crisis within the department because there are people who don't, who don't appreciate this mode of thinking. They would rather have you work for policy matters. They would rather have you work as government sort of survey teams. But that crisis is manageable, relatively less difficult to deal with. 
But when you present an argument, when you present a reasonable way of looking at the world, and I think the premise of what you described as part of a book is that there is a certain tolerance for differences. Right? Now, when that tolerance of differences is going away, when reason is being threatened, how, does, how can we draw upon the anthropological tradition to, to put reason back in its place? And specifically, I want to draw you out in what, I mean, you have said something, but I want to pinpoint that particular part of your writing where you may want to say something more. Uh, you just said it in your narrative also. You said doing anthropology is reading, writing, teaching, and fieldwork, right? Now, I want, I think these are very significant, simple steps of a very, very rigorous discipline. Reading, writing, fieldwork are not simple tasks of just reading a book and doing summaries. It involves a huge amount of creative hard labor to do that. Now, what I want to ask you is that to address this problem of reason that you're facing in the public domain, what are the disciplinary habits that anthropology needs to inculcate amongst themselves as a community and among students who come to us for guidance. While you respond to this, I'll try and post this picture to Maya. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Sachi. These are uh, wonderful observations and, uh, and provocations. And you're absolutely right to lean on precisely this challenge. I, I think that so much turns on what we expect to find in the name of reason. What, in what registers do we think and work? In what language, so to speak, do we, do we speak when we engage in the forms of critique that we pursue as anthropologists? What I found in pursuing this project, and in particular looking at the early history of empiricist inquiry in anthropology by thinking very much with the life and writing of Bronislav Malinowski, for example, who you've just been speaking of, but doing that side by side with another early American anthropologist who we know uh, primarily as a folklorist and novelist, Zora Neale Hurston, what that juxtaposition brought home for me is the fact that Anthropology has never, and this is like an argument I make, and you know one can kind of um, wrestle with it and, and take it in different directions. But but the conclusion that I came to is that is that um, the exercise of reason in anthropology or the pursuit of empiricist inquiry in anthropology has always been a bit funny insofar as it has made room for the transformative force, I argue and try to show in that part of the book, of magic, of myth, and of metaphor. That is to say, it isn't simply the case that you had other modes of expression that other people were engaged in that we may encounter as anthropologists, and we try to put them into some more reasonable form, into some more persuasive or clear narrative, argumentative form, and to call that a uh, retranscription of those other forms of expression uh, scholarship thereby, but that the work itself partakes of that um, metaphorical excess. It partakes of that mythic register. It even engages in what we might think of as magical forms of expression. There are these narrative excesses in the writing itself that I would say seek to make space for a different kind of reason. And I think that that has everything to do with the critical function that you're describing that um, I don't know that we can describe them all as anarchists necessarily, because of course, some of them were themselves collaborators with uh, imperial powers. Uh, and a, if not in an active way, then at least in a more passive way. Uh, I'm not sure that, um, that that commitment to a more radical politics extended 
through and through uh, when it came to a lot of these figures that we've come to take quite seriously. But certainly uh, in terms of opening up the registers of our intellectual um, uh, exposition and potentially making room for different styles of narration and even you know, and storytelling, I, I think are absolutely essential. And this, I think, is where we come around to that second observation that you made about the relationship between what we say as anthropologists and what others are saying themselves about their own lives, which I've been saying already, of course, in the language of myth and the language of poetry, and the language of, of fiction and all these other registers have always been there, but they exist now side by side with the narratives that we craft. And the way I see it, the question has to do with the extent to which we can make room in our own writing and in our own work, whether it's through writing or through film or through other forms of creative work, can we make room for those other registers? Can we pursue this work in a more collaborative manner? Uh, are there ways in fact to kind of um, think of the relationship between what we put forward uh, as anthropologists and what others put forward of their own lives in a, in a lateral manner, in a kind of side-by-side -side manner, rather than assuming for ourselves the right to represent those others in a more authoritative manner. So I'm really interested in ways of thinking through what we produce as anthropologists side by side with what others produce and, uh, and, and, and to really kind of think of the critical task as one of navigating between these different registers rather than the one in a sense representing the other from on high. Yeah. Uh, uh... I, I see a point, but I, I want you to say something more about a little more uh, on the craftsmanship. And I'll ask you this, a specific question with regards to craftsmanship. You know, in the post-truth world, and this is not only a characteristic of the post-truth world or the post-colonial world, uh, it is very difficult, especially in contemporary times, it's very difficult to differentiate between what is true and what is false. Right. right? Uh, and what I'm trying to suggest is when students go to do field work, they do 100 questionnaires, they do 2000 sort of uh, surveys, and they see that out of the 2000s, 90% people say one thing, and therefore that majority, they take it to be as a social fact, and they bring it to the, uh, to the desk, and they write the stories about it. But my research tells me that, you know, the nature of language is such, especially in contemporary times, that language is not used to really express yourself. Language is used to camouflage yourself. Language is used to protect yourself from, from people, especially uh, from anthropologists and researchers. Uh, and there is a very peculiar fact of the matter that in India, when you go and do field work now, uh, the villagers have had so many researchers come to them. Mm. So many researchers come to them that, you know, it is an important fact to take note of that, you know, anthropology is one of the 500 researchers that go to villages to ask them the same question. <laughs> right? Now, my, and I'll give you an example of, I'll, after you set your, your bit, I want to talk, talk more about this. You see, and what happens then is, then how do we, how do we train our eyes? How do we train ourselves? To differentiate between uh, what is reliable I'm not talking about truth. What is reliable and that can be brought to the anthropological desk to convert into, into information, into ethnography, and what is not. And I think there is a very important work by John Barnes on the sociology of lies. I think Mackie Marriott has also done an important piece on deception. So how are we to, before we can bring the, before we can open the registers, right? And not only can be concerned with representation, we need to also develop an eye, a discerning eye, uh, a disciplinary discerning eye, to be able to differentiate between truth and lies, between mm. collective lies. And this is more so because as we know, this is the age of manufactured consent. So 10 people will say the same thing. And how are we told that that is an important piece of information, an important fact that we can take to our anthropological uh, studios and then reflect on it. How are we to deal with this little problem 
a big problem actually which students face when they go to the field mm. yeah and and there are you know there are lies as you're saying at the level of interpersonal encounters intercultural encounters the way that people in smaller scale communities may put themselves and their places forward to strangers but there are lies at a much grander scale and uh and of course lies at a much grander and far more dangerous scale deceptions at a far grander and more dangerous scale have a great deal to do with contemporary politics in India as well as the United States. And you gestured toward this as well with your reference to a kind of post-truth era. I, I wonder, and this may seem, this may seem like a dangerous thing to say, but I, I do wonder whether our task in the face of such circumstances ought to be conceived solely as one of calling out the lie, of naming the deception, of identifying what is false about what is asserted to be true, or instead, and again, I recognize that this may be a dangerous way of putting things, but I'll say it anyway, could the task actually be one of propagating other myths, of propagating, if not other deceits, then at least other simulations or dissimulations of what reality could be? I think that there is always something slightly deceitful, in fact, about anthropology, deceitful in many ways, maybe deceitful in the sense that the actual circumstances of field work are dissimulated by the field worker and, and, and by the writer, maybe deceitful in the sense that people never tell the anthropologist truth to begin with, but maybe also deceitful in the sense that the account that the anthropologist puts forward is a picture of the world that is at odds with the reality at hand. Anthropologists at some level are, are, are always telling lies about the world insofar as they give their audiences a different picture of what is insofar as they're invested in the possibility of a completely different fundamental reality. What if the world was this other way? What would that do to the assumptions and ideas and expectations that we take for granted, this is not uh, deceit in, this is deceit, I would say, in a, in a more Nietzschean register. Uh, uh, that is to say, uh, deceit uh, in, in, in a register that would take, um, that would take seriously the capacity of creative expression to bring other horizons of possibility into the world. Um, Novelists, I think, also take these possibilities seriously. The, the, uh, the folk tales that Hurston collected in her travels through the American South were actually known, and she, she describes them this way in her writing as well, they were known as lies. Uh, and she's interested in that quality in these tales, what it would mean, I think, to kind of reimagine the world from the standpoint of these lies as people describe them. Um, I do wonder whether in this circumstance, when so much of our political and collective life is dominated by really terrible and oppressive fictions of particular kinds, whether part of our task ought not to be one of learning how to tell different kinds of fictions, of perpetrating different forms of fictionalizing narrative that open up forms of social possibility rather than closing them down in the name of a collective unity or collective identity. I totally agree with you, Anand, in this. but there is an institutional problem here. Mm. Uh, and that is to say that this takes time. You know, to get to those stories and fictions 
uh, which we should propagate. I am not advocating that we should expose rumors and lies. That is the job of someone else. But as anthropologists, if our task is to project a different view of the world, to project a different kind of mythology, a different kind of stories, to get to those, it takes time. Mm. And it takes months together to get to that. Uh, and I'll give you a small example of it, and then the question about institutions. I was doing work amongst the Kutia Khons in, uh, in, in Purbali, Orissa. And for six months, people kept on coming and telling me, look, I have something to show you. It is the piece of, it is a, it is a bone from the spine of a human being. I have a finger to show you. I have the skull to show you. And I said, why do you want to show me that? Because they said, these are remnants of human sacrifice. I said, I'm not interested to know that. But for six months regularly, these people came telling me that, please come and see. And that became a very, very interesting uh, question for me. Why are they coming and telling me this? So I did two kinds of research. I went and talked to elders and seniors who would have been alive before the British came there and got the true story. But what was more revealing was that a whole lot of researchers who come there ask them that one question. And they know what the answer is. Mm. Right? And they, don't, they tell them what they want to hear. And I told them, why don't you tell them the truth that you know? Why don't you propagate the myth that you know? Because it is such a beautiful story. Mm. It is such a beautiful story about your own epistemology and your ontology. They, and they said, why should we tell them this? We already have a bad name. Mm. Right? And I'm not, they were not sure if them telling the fiction would improve that image. So this was a mode of self-preservation. Mm. And I call it collective lie. Mm. Right? Now, while I was doing my research, my scholarship was cancelled. Because the funders thought that there was, this was no research. I told them I have learned 100 new words in the past six months and said, well, that is not research. My university did not allow me more than five years of doing research. My, my, my mentors had to fight for more time for me. Now, the problem is, while it is true that we should do these things, we are constrained by capital, funding, and financing. So the logic of finance and the logic of research are at odds with each other. Mm. Right? So in mm. order to create that narrative, this is a big predicament, especially in our country where funds have stopped for any kind of counter-narrative, any kind of different narrative. Because in the public eye, the moment you float a myth, you're promoting superstition, mm. right? And we are not promoting a superstition, we are promoting a different view of the world. Now that mm. communication gap, that, that the, you know, the sensors are not receptive to a story. Maya, can you put this photo on the screen? And, and this, is, this is my way of, understanding what has happened to our sensors with an S and not with a C, right? And we are working in this world. This is our audience. And I think not only outside the anthropological profession, but within the profession also. Now, Anand, this is a very important painting for me. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you will understand why. So at the bottom is the man, right? Mm -hmm. And all around are material things that are part of his part in his head. Mm. So the rest of the picture actually is telling us what is there in the head of a modern man, right? And if we follow the logic of material, uh, of material culture, then this head has no space whatsoever for any kind of <laughs> alternative <laughs> mythology that we want to project here. It is already too full. Hmm. And I'm not saying this as objects. I'm saying that the presence of these elements in our head has dampened our senses. Hmm. They are not hmm. only rusted, hmm. they are not only algae, they are, they're, they're, the, the neurons, the tips of the neurons have been destroyed. Hmm. So, right? Sir, whose painting is this? I, I'll send you the name. I can't offhand remember it. It's an Ohakan painter. Uh, and I'll, I'll text you the name. I'm sorry to the viewers also that I'm afraid I can't. I shouldn't have. I, 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 shouldn't. I ask. I ask because I. To me, the painting is itself an act, right? The painting no. is itself a kind of re-mythologization of modern life, and and so I think that part of the 
question for me has to do with how we arrive at a critical enough understanding of a condition such that you might begin to clear some of that clutter and open up space for those other ways of thinking and feeling. I don't see any other way around our ecological, political, and social impasses without doing that kind of imaginative work. And it has to begin with visualizing the limits of where we are. And so the question that I have then as, as an anthropologist interested in the force of images like this is what would it mean for us to ally ourselves with an image like this? What would it mean to take the, an image like this, not simply as a representation of the impossibility of our work, but itself as an, a certain kind of embodiment in its particularity of the kind of work that we could or should be doing. This is what I try to show in the final chapter of the book where I look at how it is that certain ideas have begun to cross over between the domains of contemporary anthropology and archeology span on the one hand and contemporary art in the United States where artists are actually taking up anthropological forms of imagination, trying to imagine, say, for example, what's going on in the mind of this figure caught up in all this stuff uh, as a way of, again, opening up other forms of possibility by looking at this world from the standpoint of a future beyond. Now, all of that requires support. It requires institutional space. It requires uh, a space in the public sphere. And there are larger questions about how it is that one can begin to create those institutional openings, the emergence of other forms of, uh, of uh, other kinds of educational institutions, even like Ahmedabad University, uh, I think are important that way. The emergence of other spaces for public uh, discussion and, uh, and exchange are also crucial. Uh, there are, I think, interesting things happening even uh, in the blogosphere online that are you know, I've, I've noticed, for example, in my own circles, that while our journals have a much more, uh, in, in, my, in a field like mine, in anthropology, have a much more conventional picture of what constitutes good uh, research and writing, you have the emergence of other magazines that uh, online in which anthropologists and ethnographers are writing, but in many ways have a more radical picture of what this work could look like, what it could feel like. And so I, I think you're absolutely right that finding institutional spaces for these alternative forms of possibility is absolutely essential. I am wondering whether folks like us can think of ourselves as, think of cultivating allies in, in that endeavor um, from these other domains of, of cultural practice. Sure. Thank you and thanks for that. Um... Thanks, Professor Visaji. Um, are there, I think we have just a few minutes. I'm so sorry, but just a few minutes for some questions. Um, maybe now the quickest way is to either signal with a raised hand or just quickly yeah. your name uh, that and then just ask your question. Um, so Maya, I think I've yeah. written some questions. So can I just read them out for- Oh, great. You have, okay, all right. So sure. I think there's a question from uh, Amol Agarwal, who's a colleague okay. at Ahmedabad Yeah, University, Amol, yeah. Professor of Economics. So Amol is asking that economists have increasingly started to use ethnographic data by anthropologists uh, as suggested in a paper that he gives the link for. Uh, what do the anthropologists think of economic, uh, economics using their data? What are the strengths and limitations of using anthropologist uh, data for economics? So that is Amol's question. Hmm. Hmm. You want me to uh, say one more question and then okay. we can... Yeah, why, yeah, I think that would be... Yeah, okay. Uh, the, uh, another one is from uh, Daniel Shen, and he's asking Anand that uh, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the kinds of fiction that anthropology uh, has uh, told itself throughout its history uh, and uh, uh, as irre irredeemably colonial uh, as more recently this year, liberal humanist uh, revanchism uh, and uh, how the story that Professor Pandian tells about the discipline fits into this larger ecology of storytelling around what anthropology is and its possibilities. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I would actually 
make a common answer to both of those questions. I The position I take in this book is that storytelling in anthropology is a kind of speculative endeavor in which one is invited to consider a question of this kind. What if this other world that we find ourselves in, in the space of this text or this space of cultural expression uh, or ethnographic expression is, is the world itself? What if this world that would appear to be so foreign and um, strange uh, is itself the actual world? What if reality were actually this? Uh, that that speculative question uh, that has to do with the possible reality of a completely different ontology, a completely different uh, picture of the nature of things is the, uh, is the motivation for uh, narrative exposition in the field. And so I actually see, and I talk about this in the book as well, I see a kind of kinship between anthropology and speculative fiction. I write about uh, the science fiction novelist Ursula Le Guin, who was the daughter of two prominent American anthropologists in whose writing ethnographers and anthropologists appear so often, and whose science fiction therefore has a deeply anthropological cast as a way of concretizing that idea of anthropology as in fact um, an endeavor that verges on speculative fiction, that to me dovetails or that to me offers a certain way of wrestling with the questions that arise from um, uh, the questions that were posed by the, uh, the, the other uh, commentator uh, about anthropology and economics. And simply put, um, I'm interested in ways of I'm interested in the possibility that data can't simply be taken from an anthropological account. Like, can you generate the account in such a manner that the data can't be lifted from it, that to actually engage with the data, so to speak, you have to enter into that world. Uh, and whenever data can simply be lifted from an account to serve other purposes, I would say at some level, we've failed to a certain degree as anthropologists in inviting people in almost compelling people to enter into that other world in a slightly different manner. Mm -hmm. Can you just give me 30 seconds? I'll be, because um, 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 I'm, I'm at home just, uh, and it's, it's morning here. I just need 30 seconds. I'll be right back. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I, I want to say something to this to the, my economist friend. Yes. You know, a very good example is the work of the recent Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Banerjee, Professor Banerjee, uh, where he actually does field work uh, to understand economic behavior of poor people. And uh, what I learned from his work is that for very long it was assumed that poor people have to behave in a certain way when they had resources in their hands. For instance, if you give them money, there is a priority list bit, even before they're asking them that they must first spend on education, where education is very important, and then everything else will follow. And in an interview, he told us that when he asked the poor, what would they do with the money? And they said, I would first buy television. And this was completely out of the normal. And when they explored why he wanted to do so, he said, unless I am exposed to the world outside, how will I know what action and what possibilities I have to do? Now, I think if economists start to do ethnography, then I think the ontology and epistemology of economics would change drastically. Mm. That's a lovely way of putting it. <laughs> Actually, on that note, in fact, we have a student, uh, one of our colleagues is a student of Professor Banerjee. Uh, Vijit Banerjee, and I think he <laughs> a question uh, from Saurav Sarkar. Okay. And he, he, he's saying that uh, he's an economist, of course, uh, and economists mostly do quantitative empirical research, both experimental as well as non-experimental, like you just mentioned. Uh, and we frequently use anthropological and other social science studies to come up with hypotheses as well as frequently cite them while writing papers. Nevertheless, methodological dialogues across disciplines often seem esoteric for each side, 
with the literature addressing similar topics proceeding parallelly so what are your views and uh, i think this is this was a question uh, he was asking to pro probably anand right uh, anand you yeah um i one thing i have wonder to be honest i mean this is a this is a conversation that we we are, so this this conversation is framed by the idea of methods in the social sciences but i have actually felt more and more that the position of the intellectual position of anthropology is somewhere between the social sciences and the humanities and that it isn't therefore simply a question of putting anthropological methods side by side with economics with sociology with political science but also history and literature and film studies and and, and to be honest then i think one could really then begin to ask serious questions about the way that knowledge and method and technique are siloed in all of these disciplines in some pretty uh, um, blinkered ways and and what it would mean to think across a range of divides i think that when we think about a field like anthropology there are ever so many ways that our methods cross over into into all of these different fields there is economic anthropology there's psychological anthropology there's literary anthropology there's of course uh, a kind of media anthropology all of these things uh, are there to me the bottom line is whether or not we are engaged in that work with the kind of commitment that professor sachi was also speaking of in trying to somehow open up that space for an alternative reality and um and i think that if one begins from the standpoint of that political and social commitment rather than from the standpoint of a disciplinary purity uh the question of what methods one uses to understand a particular situation ultimately becomes almost a kind of ethical problem rather than uh than a than a problem of um of knowledge per se and and i think that that's actually to me that's quite important you know to to refer to refer these questions not simply back to any picture we might have of good inquiry simply for the sake of inquiry but all, but but to bring it back around to the question of the um the moral and ethical stakes of that inquiry oh uh, yeah thanks anand um so um if if we have another 2 minutes and sarthak i don't know if you have more questions but i actually wanted to just jump in with i also one. wanted to ask one question but okay okay go ahead no you go ahead it's fine no actually my question for, i mean raise out of uh, i mean what professor sachi was mentioning about you know this kind of a uh, uh, very designed and cosmetic answers that we find often on the field because which is some kind of a practiced perfection those answers come with and i do field work on elections and studying vote buying in bihar and maharashtra and i often find that uh, some kind sometimes i have to often filter out a lot of these cosmetic uh, answers uh, which we encounter during field work uh, but my question is uh, when we are repeatedly visiting the field and maybe in the first visit or first um, you know first round of ethnography we do find that okay some of the things we are getting collecting are new information and so you know we are more um, uh, attuned to getting new information but by the time we are doing a longitudinal study of like you know repeatedly visiting the field same field for the fifth or sixth time we already have a lot of information and then we know that okay this is a lie this is a lie so how do we let not let uh, ourselves get affected by what we are you know getting uh, understanding in those fourth or fifth round uh, visits or fifth round of study so i mean because uh, somewhere down the line also the research starts affecting our way of thinking towards a particular subject and we cannot be ultimately unbiased uh, you know by uh, 
a long yeah. time ethnographic engagement. I, I think, um, and again, my answer would have to be brief just for the interest of time, but, um, but I think we have to let ourselves be affected. I think, we, I think we have to allow ourselves uh, to be affected by what we encounter. And I think that if we're encountering things again and again, um, that is itself a reality that we need to wrestle with. So why did things come back to us again and again with a certain, in a certain form? The task shouldn't be to somehow get behind it, but to confront the density of what we're presented with, uh, because that is another layer of reality. In fact, it's the reality of that encounter and we have to let it change what we're hoping to do, which is to say, we have to let it affect us and our picture of what research here ought to mean. Just to add a footnote to that, Anand, uh, you know, a very useful method is to disprove what you know, right? To find falsifications of what is presented to you. So when yeah. you try to find out a falsification of what everybody's telling you, then you actually enter very, very unexplored terrains, right? And in those terrains, it is very, very important to confront what is the dominant. And I think I find it very helpful to confront the dominant in the search for disproving what the dominant is saying. And mm. it takes a long time. Mm. <laughs> I have a short uh, question. Um which is coming from a lot of nearly 20 years of conversation with Sachi sir. And um, it's related to something that was being discussed. Uh, and I think which something that Anand said, which is uh, about knowledge and the ethical and how, how does one think, why is a knowledge problem not also a problem of ethics? And I think that is, a, uh, that is something that I actually always hold up the work of uh, Hana Arendt towards, uh, an towards the anthropological tradition and what is the idea of a theory of action when you're talking about experience and being part of a certain uh, relationship with experience uh, and experiences and I mean, I'm not even going into my thoughts on the field, but how does one uh, then begin to think and I always evoke uh, uh, Hana Arendt's work, I evoke Edith Stein's work who's a, another female philosopher. She was a student of Husserl, uh, who actually became a nun. Um, and then Simone Weil's work on the political. So how does one uh, kind of begin to even articulate in a discipline like anthropology? And I'm not, I don't mean this in a, in a sense of uh, you have to create an NGO where you go and do fieldwork. That's not what my direction is. But to even have the conversation on a theory of action or to think of knowledge or the creation and the production of knowledge uh, much more in a Gandhian sense. Mm. I don't know. Uh, something that it's always, uh, this is something that Sachi, Savya Sachi, I'm sorry, so I can only call him Sachi, sir, since I've known him for 20 years. Uh, um, and I mean, this whole, what is, how does one begin to think of these things? Sorry, this is like at the end of things I'm asking a question like this, but. I think Anand, you had an interesting moment in the book when you talked about the alignments between experience and, uh, and experiment and experimentation. Uh, and that, uh, when I reread that, it remind it it I it sort of Gandhi's whole experiments with truth and what it might mean to uh, briefly step outside of just the kind of banality of ongoing experience and in have a more you know reflective relationship to your own experience. It it struck me that that was a I kind of flagged that in my mind mentally. So I was thinking about that anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll uh, please uh, take that if you want, but I know you have to go. So I, uh, I, I'm not, <laughs> we'll keep asking questions if you, unless you put your foot down and leave. Yeah, no, I, um, it's just that my, I have to get my daughter to school. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so why don't you just? Um, I love. I, I really do appreciate the question. I think Maya is absolutely right that I see. Um, I see the pursuit of knowledge as a kind of ethos, and so uh, it's precisely that relationship between experience and experimentation, or an experimental ethos, that is at stake in the picture of anthropological knowledge and its pursuit that the that the book puts forward. So um, maybe I'll just leave you with the last word, and then I'll dash off if that's okay. And again, my apologies to everyone. It's just literally I have to. Um, it's eight o'clock here and I have to get my daughter to school. So, 
part so of we this huge, hugely appreciate your making this time for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. This could go on for a long time. Thanks so much for, for talking to us. Yeah, no, of course. So is that, um, is that, is that okay then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, said, please. <laughs> So much. That you wanted to say something though, Maya, and you were kind enough to, to organize this. So I wanted just to leave it to you. That's all. Um, sorry, do you want me to just say what I was thinking? But it'll probably, yeah. Okay, okay. I, it'll probably yeah. come out. And I was still uh, stuck at that moment when my computer gave up. So I was stuck on the, the myth and reason and falsification uh, moment. And a very mundane example just struck me, uh, you know, when the pandemic broke and we were in this kind of collapse of knowledge uh, uh, kind of situation. Um, that, you know, one, the state was, um, the state uh, found, it was a sort of mysterious lack of uh, taking up whatever knowledge, fee, like date, data, if we will, existed, like just simple things on the figures that we have on uh, old age numbers or maternal mortality or infant uh, malnutrition. So the existing data we couldn't make use of. And on the other hand, there was this constant production of a kind of mythos of what sorts of treatments are available and, um, you know, um, state support really for those kinds of, uh, you know, uh, treatments, you know, ranging from the bizarre, like cow urine or whatever to, uh, you know, the more, uh, more plausible ones, like, I don't know, yoga and, and, and pranayam. So there was some kind of interesting like collapse between this distrust of distrust of reason uh, and uh, a mythos which we can't just actually reject as a kind of falsification because i think it was doing some important uh, work there so i just yeah. had, it just that example just came to me so i think yeah. even in anthropology our training or disposition towards myth and all it's not just a kind of it is a, a re-enchantment but not always just a good thing it's it that's also right. some that, that's exactly faculty right. to look at uh, you know what we are being confronted with that's so, a salutary warning there's nothing straightforward about this um, yeah. in terms of the re-embrace of myth or, myth re or yeah. of alternatives because the noxious politics that we wrestle with is so often grounded precisely in, in the myths of various kinds of mythicization of alternatives that uh that have toxic consequences <laughs> Um, but I still think we need to find more creative and uh, open, um, uh, um, more creative and um, inclusive ways of navigating that space. I think we need to take back that space. We need to learn how to take back that space of the mythic uh, and, and to not allow it to be occupied completely by uh, the forces of exclusionary nationalism. So that's what I would say. So thank you all very thank much. Thanks, Anand. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I really appreciated these questions. Yeah. All right. Thank you, especially to Sachi, sir, for your comments. Thank right. you, all, Professor Anand. Yes. Lovely talking to you. Lovely. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Professor Savisachi, thanks so much um, for. Uh, I think any uh, any time we listen to you, it's like we're all frantically taking notes because it's just such an edu in such an education in uh, in in thinking anthropologically, as it were. Um, Sarthak, uh, how do we, should we? Close yes, yes. Or? So, I mean, uh, so I would like to thank everybody uh, who joined us today. And I'm sorry that we could not take uh, all the questions to the speakers because of uh, paucity of time. Uh, but uh, I mean, whatever the discussion uh, was very exciting and very engaging. And uh, we will be putting up the video, uh, edited version of this video recording on the, the YouTube channel. So please feel uh, free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Uh, for them also to benefit from this kind of a very insightful discussion. And uh, we are very thankful to Professor Anand Pandian who just left and Professor uh, Sabisachi for being with us today. And to all the uh, all the participants, all the audience mem uh, members who have taken time out to come and listen and join us and also encourage us in a way by uh, attending these uh, webinars that we have been organizing uh, because uh, your participation kind of also motivates us to move for, further forward from one event to another. So we are really thankful to all of your support and we hope to uh, uh, see you on our uh, next webinar, uh, which is happening just uh, in a couple of days from now, uh, which will be on artificial intelligence. So um, that is again, a very interesting one and the posters and publicity material will be available on the Ahmedabad University website. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.